Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will talk on the economics of deflation. So what we do is we will do is to, first we will try to find out what is deflation, the definition of deflation. Then we will look on the causes of deflation and then on the consequences. So the basis is naturally the question, what is deflation? We have some indications from The Economist, the magazine. It says it's a pernicious threat. Uh, it's not only a problem, it's actually the world's biggest economic problem. Uh, it... Another definition, and this comes from Christine Lagarde. Christine Lagarde is the managing director of the IMF, of the Inter International Monetary Fund. So she must know what deflation is. <laughs> uh, and she has a definition of deflation which finally allow allowed me to find a photo, a picture of deflation on the internet. Hmm? I studied deflation for a long time and finally I got a picture actually out of it. So what is deflation for Christine Lagarde? <laughs> Deflation is an ogre. <laughs> okay. It's similar to the, I'm, uh, to the economists know that it's somehow threatening. Um, so the next question is, what can we do about this? What can we, what can be done against this ogre? What do, what do you think can be done against it? <laughs> Well, exactly. <laughs> that is, that is uh, what can be done about it. Um, Bernanke, already in his speech in 2003, titled Deflation, Make Sure It Does Not Happen Here, said the US government has a technology called a printing press that allows it to produce as many US dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. Also, great uh, insight that <laughs> you can destroy the value of your currency no matter if you only try hard enough, you can destroy the value of your currency. Um, so the solution to the ogre is uh, we just print, uh, print the money and give then the money to the banks and the Wall Street guys and they will save us from the deflation ogre. And just as simply as that. You know? Thank goodness for, for these Wall Street guys because uh, they, will, they will take the new money and fight bravely and unselfishly against the deflation ogre. <laughs> uh, I mean, what would we do without them? Uh, we would probably <laughs> we would die in a deflation holocaust or something like this. <laughs> So you see, uh, deflation is used as a scapegoat uh, to justify inflation. Mm. Uh, it's portrayed as such a disaster that it has to be fought at all cost. Uh, you have to inflate and inflate and inflate. Uh, even if prices are rising, because um, when prices are, are increasing only slowly, a little bit like one or two percent, you're still very close to the abyss because deflation is basically like quicksand. Uh, if you get into it, you will be sucked into it. So if inflation, price inflation is only one or two percent, it's already too dangerous because when your one foot is in it, then you might be, you might be lost uh, in a deflationary downward spiral. So, um, and you know, of course, when there's inflation, when there's an increase in the money supply, there's a redistribution, the first receivers of the new money. They buy at the old, still low prices. Prices are bidden up, and they are the later receivers and the last receivers of the new money that see that prices are increasing. Their buying prices are increasing, but their income has not increased yet. So there's a re redistribution in favor of the first receivers to the detriment of the last receivers. So the strategy is simple. Whenever uh, over-indebted over agents, individuals, banks, governments 
want new money. They say, well, the deflation ogre comes, uh, so please print new, new money, engage in quantitative easing, lower interest rates, buy government bonds, bailout Greece, and so on. Okay, yeah, this is what we just said. So, um, come on, what, what is the deflation then? In the mainstream, the definition is a general decrease in, in prices. Uh, Austrians tend to distinguish between price deflation, a general fall in prices, and monetary deflation, a reduction in this money supply. Huh? I will here focus on, on the ogre, which is price deflation. No? What are possible causes? Well, now we look on the causes of price deflation, or economic growth, huh? uh, innovations, new technology, capital accumulation, extension of the division of labor, more goods and services are produced. Uh, the producers try to buy money with, with them, so the price of money is bidden up, prices tend to fall, the purchasing power of money tends to increase. Well, you would not really think that this is negative, that this is an ogre or a threat, but rather this would be a blessing uh, when prices fall due to economic growth. Second type, uh, here comes the ogre you already, you see. Uh, the second type of deflation is, or cause of deflation is an increased demand for money or also called cash building deflation. And there are several reasons why um, there may be an increased demand for money. One is an increased industrial demand. When we have um, a commodity money, when we have gold as money, for example, and there's more industrial demand, for some reason people start to value subjectively gold more than silver, gold jewelry more than silver jewelry. People stop buying silver rings, stop, uh, 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 stop, stop buying silver rings and start buying gold rings. Then there's an additional industrial demand for, for gold. And therefore, the price of gold, the purchasing power of money, will, will rise for industrial reasons. Another reason is that the quality of money increases. Uh, the quality of money is the subjectively perceived capacity of money to, to fill its functions, to be a good medium of exchange, um, yeah, unit of account and store of value. So a good money fulfills good this, these functions, especially the store of value function. So when people for some reason start to think that money begins to be a better money, they will start to hire it, to value it higher in comparison to other goods and services. So this is actually similar to the industrial demand. No? In the case of the industrial demand, people start to value gold higher because yeah, they, they like it suddenly because maybe a celebrity started to wear gold jewelry instead of silver, so, so they value uh, gold higher. And here we have the people this case that people start to value the money higher in relation to other goods because they think it has become a better money. An example would be for, um, after the Civil War, um, specie payment was uh, suspended. Uh, there was no redemption in gold. You could not go, go with your greenback and receive gold. And then in, nine, in 1875, there was a resumption of specie payment. So this resumption of PC payment would be an increase in the quality of money because it makes a difference if you can get gold for your greenback or not. No? And obviously, the act of the resumption itself did not change the quantity of money at all. It only changed the quality, it increased the quality. Another example would be that we have a fiat currency and a government that is at war with, an, with other governments. So if it loses the war, maybe the currency is not worth anything anymore. And then the government starts to uh, win an important battle. It would be also then 
probably now it will win the war, so the fiat currency will survive and increase in the quality of the currency. Another reason uh, for an increased demand to hold money is an increased uncertainty. You know, people hold money because they don't know when they have to make the expenditures, nor, nor, nor how much they will, money they will need. So if in, when uncertainty increases, people prefer to hold a higher cash balance, for example, in an economic crisis, which is also very useful because it gives uh, agents and companies flexibility. Yeah. Of course, in an economic crisis, at the beginning, it's unclear where the demand will shift, where will the, to which sectors the new demand will go. So it's good if you are liquid, if you have high flexibility, a high cash balance. Here the question is, how, how would this work um, when everyone at the same time tries to increase their cash balance? Yeah. This cash building deflation. When all people want to increase their money holdings at the same time without an increase in the supply of money. When all people want to hoard these evil hoarders, when we all become evil hoarders, at the same time. Well, there we have to re remind, um, think that what people want are real cash balances, not nominal cash balances. They want a cash balance, they want money to, to buy goods and services. So what is not, what is not important is, is not the nominal cash balance, if I have $1,000 or $2,000, but how many goods and services I can buy with them. And if uncertainty increases, I want to have a higher real cash balance. So I, can, I will be able to buy more goods and services. So let's imagine that we all convert into evil hoarders. We want more money, but the money supply is constant. There's no monetary inflation. So what would we do? What would we do? We will stop buying and we will try to, to sell our goods and services as fast as possible to get more money. But obviously no one wants to buy our services and goods because all want to <laughs> have higher, a higher cash balance. So what will happen? Well, we will have to lower our prices until we find someone willing to buy. So prices will fall. What is the consequences of falling prices? What happens with the real cash balance? Goes up or down? Up, exactly. That is what we wanted. How much will prices fall until they, they are at a level where people start to buy again and restrict, restrict the, their selling? When the desired cash balances, real cash balances are attained. So when individuals finally attain their ends. So due to an increase of uncertainty, people want to hold a higher real cash, balances, <coughs> cash balance and they attain their goals. Huh? So. so also in this case, the market works. Huh? People attain their end with the cash building deflation, prices fall, they get a higher real cash balance. So how can we say that this was, would be a threat for the economy <coughs> or an ogre? Because what it does is it fulfills the, uh, the ends, the objectives of the people. We will come back later to this question. Yeah, and then we have also speculative uh, cash building when people expect the purchasing power of money to increase, they will buy money and by this already bid up the purchasing power. Okay, now we come to a cause of deflation that would not occur in a free market. And therefore, we see the ogre there a little bit closer. Um, this is bank credit deflation, which occurs after credit expansion of a fractional reserve banking system which could not occur in a free market with the full reserves. Um, you know that fractional reserve banks can expand credit inter and introduce this new money, this new credit uh, through the loan market. And due to the additional loans, um, entrepreneurs start more and more and more ambitious investment projects. 
more than can be successfully completed with the scarce resources of society. <laughs> and sooner or later, this will become apparent and the bust will occur. Businesses will go bust. People will not be able to buy back, uh, to pay back their loans. And then banks will have losses. And due to these losses, the confidence in the banking system will be reduced. People, especially if no, there's not a central bank, they will try to redeem uh, their deposits, they with, withdraw their money in cash, they start to pay more in cash, banks become more cautious. Mm, when, uh, when old loans are paid back, banks don't give out uh, new loans immediately. There will be bad loans, ba loans that will not be paid back. So all this uh, causes the amount of loans to be reduced. There's a credit contraction, which is a reduction in the supply of money, which is a natural consequence of the boom. It's inevitable that the money supply shrinks uh, in a recession. Of course, you can have the central bank work against it, but there's this tendency that uh, um, there will be credit contraction in the banking system. This speeds up the liquidation of malinvestments because the fall in prices makes, uh, the fall in prices makes it harder for indebted businesses to stay afloat, to survive. Only the best companies will uh, survive and they will, they will be strengthened because their comp competitors will be gone. Um, so the malinvestments will be liquidated faster. Uh, the resources that are sucked up in these malinvestments will be liberated uh, faster and be available for uh, new, more sustainable projects faster. So the bank credit deflation actually is just a market reaction to the aggression of bank credit expansion and the artificial boom, and it speeds up the recovery. So it's actually also something that is beneficial, uh, if you think that it's beneficial to speed up the recovery. But again, it would not occur on a free market, because on a free market you have full reserves and no <coughs> uh, credit, uh, artificial credit expansion. Well, now come, comes our friend, the government. Um, the government can also cause prices to fall. The most crude um, example is price decree deflation. There, the government just decreased prices to fall. It introduces maximum prices below the market price. If the price for one gallon of milk is $4. It says, well, the maximum price you can uh, ask four is one dollar. This would be a price decree deflation. Does not occur very often, sometimes. Uh, in Germany in 1930s, it uh, occurred that Chancellor Brüning declared, for example, that all wages had to fall 10%. That's a price decree deflation. In this case, labor unions had very much power, too much power. They, Wages were artificially high, artificially high, so he de just decreed that wages had to fall 10%. Second type of fiat deflation introduced of the government by the government is a coercive monetary deflation. So a coercive reduction of the money supply. How does this work? Well, basically it means that the government collects money and then destroys it. Or it uses the money to give it to the banks and tell the banks to increase their reser reserves. Uh, and that uh, instead of 10% that you have a reserve, we give you this tax money and you increase your reserves to tw uh, 20%. Uh, actually, it's a way to, possible way to resume specie payment. This is um, what was done in the US after the Civil War, when specie payment was suspended. Um, and it may be actually used to introduce a 100% reserve system if you use the tax money and give it to the banking system to increase its reserves. There are two types of it. There's the fiscal um, coercive monetary deflation, where you government just takes the taxes uh, the tax money de de destroys the money or gives it to the banking system to increase its reserves or to give it to the central bank. You know, 
and a gold standard to give gold to the central bank, so the central bank has higher reserves. The bond deflation is that the government issues bonds and takes the receipts, the money, to destroy it or to increase the reserves of the banking system or the central bank. And then we have confiscatory deflation, that the government just confisc confiscates the money in order to destroy it or to exchange it for new money or to freeze, freeze it temporarily. There an example would be uh, Germany after the Second World War, uh, currency reform, 1948. All old gold rice marks were confiscated and exchanged uh, for 10 old rice marks, you would get one new Deutschmark. No? So it was a confiscatory deflation. Uh, a recent example is the, are the bank holidays in Greece. No? The government basically said, froze the money. People cannot get their money right now. So they, cannot, uh, they are not allowed to withdraw their money. It has been confiscated, at least temporarily. So there's a pressure, downward pressure on prices. And last we, lastly, we have here legal tender deflation. Let's assume that there are two currencies in use, gold and silver, and then the government declares gold legal tender, which means that even though you have a contract made in silver, you are allowed to pay, pay it in gold. Which uh, implies that the government establish an exchange rate between gold and silver. It says well, you can use, uh, even though you have a silver debt, you can use gold to, to pay with it. And in this relation, this, in this exchange relation. And then it's typically used to over, or one of them is overvalued. Uh, if gold is overvalued, then gold will disappear from circulation. Uh, uh, no, if gold is overvalued, silver will disappear from uh, uh, circulation because it's undervalued. People will hoard the, the silver and people will only use the, the overvalued gold, which means that there is a reduction of the money supply because, be, because before people used gold and silver as a medium of exchange. And now one of them, silver, is driven out of circulation. So we have here also a reduction of the money supply caused by the government fiat deflation. So there we, can, we might say it's actually an ogre, but because the reason for it is the use of violence. So now we can, okay, and this is of course more beneficial, the other types of deflation, because yeah, they fulfill uh, the ends of individuals, voluntary interacting ones. Okay, now on the consequences of deflation. Now we look on the consequences independent of the cause of the fall in prices. Huh? Well, what is a price? Well, it is just an exchange relationship, which in, and in, every, in any exchange, there's one buyer and one seller. The buyer, as a buyer, we normally prefer lower prices, and as a seller, we normally prefer higher prices. What does it mean when prices fall? Good for buyers, bad for sellers. No? So the most important consequence here is a redistribution. Buyers profits uh, in comparison to the situation when prices would have been higher and sellers lose in comparison to the situation where prices would not have fallen, would have been higher. No? <clears throat> um, the, the thing is that in a market economy, we normally are, we all are buyers and sellers. <laughs> we sell our goods and services, services mainly our labor services, and, and as sellers, we want higher prices, and we are also buyers, we buy goods and services, and as, as buyers, we want lower prices, and there we want price deflation. Moreover, obviously the buying price of one is the selling price of the other party of the exchange. 
So if we don't know the cause of price deflation, but, but we, we only know that prices are falling, we cannot say at all that this is bad for the economy as a whole. There's just a redistribution. Uh, if my buying prices fall faster than my selling prices, I benefit. And if your buying prices fall slower than your selling prices, you lose. So the main effect is a redistribution. Some individuals will win, others will lose. But in the aggregate, for the overall economy, we cannot say that we are worse off. So there's obviously no pernicious threat. There's no over. But, so, so what are the arguments uh, brought forward to, to, to say why deflation is such, why deflation is the biggest problem for the world? Let's look at the myth or, on deflation, or about deflation. The first myth is that falling prices hurt companies because companies have lower sales revenues and therefore there's a cumulative contraction. As they have lower sales, they will contract uh, um, less workers and there will be even less demand, lower sales and so on. Well. Not so fast. It's like uh, counting 101. Um, what is essential for companies is the spread between buying and selling prices. Uh, and to make profits, uh, a company needs a positive spread between the, buying price, uh, the, the selling prices and the buying prices, its costs. Uh, and one can, have, one can have a positive spread between the selling prices and the buying prices at a higher and at a lower price level. It's not, not only the selling prices fall, but also the buying prices. Now imagine a company that has revenues of $1 million and costs of $800,000. <coughs> Let's now assume that there's a price deflation and revenues collapse to $500,000. Costs collapse also to $400,000. The real profit situation of the company has not changed, is unchanged. Hmm. And of course, you can assume a situation where, where the costs fall faster than re the revenues. The buying prices, the costs fall faster than the selling prices. Uh, so the real profit situation may actually increase during a price deflation. Uh, hmm. a, price, a fall in prices does not say anything about the general business climate. The question is always what happens with the profits, the differential, differential between the buying and the selling proceeds. And of course, this differential, it may, may increase, uh, increase or decrease when prices are generally falling, uh, rising or falling. Now, the general tendency in prices does not say anything about the tendency in this price differential uh, for profits. Okay, so this was the first argument. The second argument is somewhat more sophisticated uh, because it says that not falling prices are a problem, but the expectation, the expectation of falling prices would be a disaster for the economy. It's like I, as a consumer, I, I, I expect prices to, to fall. No? So I think, well, tomorrow prices will be lower so today I don't consume. And it happens that I'm right, prices, prices fall and say, well, I, I, was, I was correct. Well, I now think it will continue. Tomorrow prices will be even lower. So I don't consume either. So I, I get a little bit thinner. Then <laughs> next, next, day, next day prices are lower and I say, oh, great. It worked. I, I, I will not consume either tomorrow. So I get thinner and thinner. <laughs> <laughs> Until, I <laughs> Until I die. So what is, <laughs> what is the problem with this argument? Well, no one would act like that. No, no one would do that. Or imagine that you expect that gasoline prices will be 10% lower. It's about 10% lower next year. Would you not fill up your gas tank for one year because of that? Um, 
We all know, for example, that, price, that prices in the technology sector will fall or that the quality will uh, improve. And we know that the next generation of smartphones will be cheaper or better than today's, or both, uh, cheaper and better. So there we have deflationary expectations. Does this mean that the technology sector is depressed or that businesses are not investing there because they fear their prices will fall? No, no, not at all. The sector flourishes and sales even increase. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only consumers, you know, consumers that uh, buy technology, also investors, companies, they invest in new technology, even though they know that the technology will be cheaper in the future, or there will be better technology available, but they nevertheless, they, they buy it now because it gives them a competitive edge to have the newest technology. And they want the newest technology rather sooner than later. And consumers want the new iPhone 6 rather sooner than later. That's a universal law of time preference. Moreover, even if people abstain from consumption for some time, the, de the decreasing sales prices for businesses lead to a pressure to reduce costs. So companies will then start to replace workers with machines and more machines must be produced. So there will be an increase in the demand for labor in the capital goods sector. Workers who lost their jobs in the consumer goods sector will find new, new employment in the capital goods sector. So the capital stock grows when people save uh, without leading to mass unemployment. So the increase in real, real savings uh, due to expectations, due to the expectation of, uh, of falling prices is not a threat, but would lead to sustainable economic growth. Okay, next argument. It says, hey, okay. Uh, it says, yeah, you are right. The price differential is the important thing. It's true that costs also fall, but they fall only in the long run and they, in the short run, they are sticky. They fall slower than the selling prices. Eh? The selling price of companies fall quickly, but some costs are fixed. They fall only with a lag. And there we have, uh, ah, there we have two, two example, uh, two types. Um, well, first of all, is we have to say that entrepreneurs, their main task is to anticipate future prices. They have an idea of a product that would satisfy consumer wants, and then the next in the next step they have to. Um, think to anticipate what will consumers be able, willing to pay for this product. And in function of the expectation of surprise of their product, they will bid for factors of production. They have, the, the entrepreneur has a new smartphone and he thinks he will be able to sell it in one year for $100. In function of this price, he will bid for workers, for other factors of production. So you, you see here that actually the prices of the factors of production are determined before uh, uh, the price of, of, uh, of the product. So buying prices, yes, they can fall faster than selling prices. Logically, actually, it's not that, co that uh, costs determine prices. It's not that first are the costs and then later are the prices determined. No, it's, it's the expected prices in the future that determines the costs. Um, so you would expect actually costs falling before uh, prices. Of course, you, the entrepreneur may be incorrect and in one year he will not be able to sell the product for $100 but only less and then he might have bidden too much for the factors of production. He will suffer losses. Uh, but an entrepreneur can always be too optimistic on the future selling price of the product. Even if prices rise 10%, he, uh, he may be, have been too optimistic with his $100. Mm. So entrepreneur, entrepreneurs can err if prices generally rise or fall. No, this is not an argument. Yeah, and then the argument is that wages are sticky. Yeah? 
But here we have also to uh, keep in mind that entrepreneurs try to anticipate the selling price of the product in the future. And the workers, they also, when they negotiate for their wage, they are trying to anticipate the future purchasing power of, of, of money and of their wage. And if a, if a worker actually expects the purchasing power of money to be lower than it actually will be, and asks for, for a too high wage, or a wage that is too high, he may bid himself out of the market. For example, let's think of a worker that believes that the price level will increase 20%. Uh, and he demands a 20% wage increase. But then prices only increase 10%. So then he might have bidden <coughs> himself out of the market. But that is due to rising prices. You, the same is true when prices fall. Uh, let's say that the worker thinks that prices will fall 20%. And then he agrees, okay, I agree that, I agree that my wa uh, wage will be cut 20%. But he errs. Prices fall not 20%, but 50%. Well, then he will be also driven uh, out, of, uh, out of the market. Huh? So, so you see, the general tendency of prices does not matter. Huh? The worker can always ask for a too, too high wage that will... Uh, cause him to be out of the market. Mm. And it, of course it's also true that the government interventions in the labor market make wages more and more sticky, that wages cannot adapt quickly, uh, ne cannot be rene renegotiated easily, and government interventions can and do cause unemployment by lifting labor costs below, uh, above the market clear clearing level. But again, government invention, intervention will cause unemployment no matter what the general tendency of prices is, when prices fall or when prices rise. And lastly, when prices cannot fall because of rigid labor markets, because of government intervention, and this causes unemployment, the, pro the problem is not a fall in, in prices. The problem is not price inflation. The problem is exactly that <laughs> the opposite, that prices do not fall. The problem is not the price deflation, but price deflation would be solu the solution of the problem. A fall in prices would be so the solution of the problem. So the problem, uh, the solution would be more falling prices, in this case that wages would be allowed to fall, but the government intervention prevents this price inflation. Okay, this on wages, now on debts. Um, the, this, argument, this argument goes the following. It says, um, some costs are fixed in the short and medium run, and these are debts. Uh, debts pay, debt payments are normally fixed. Um, so the argument goes that the real debt burden of companies increase in a price deflation, and when companies expect prices to fall, they will not take on more debts, they will not invest, because it will become ever more difficult to pay, to service the debt. Oh, I mean, like, let's say before a price deflation, your income, your income is $3,000, you have a monthly debt payment of $1,000, then due to a price deflation, your income falls to $2,000, but your debt payment remains the same, it becomes more difficult to service the debt. No, this is a problem. Um, then the argument goes, as, as uh, the debt burden has increased, the uh, e economy will collapse as there is a const contraction of aggregate demand. Okay, let's think about this argument. It's true that here the debtor, the debtor is losing, but at the same time the creditor is winning, of course. The creditors receive higher payments, uh, or payments with a higher purchasing power of money. So the aggregate demand does not contract at all. The losses of the debtors are exactly balanced by the benefits, profits of the creditors. There's a problem for debtors, but there's a problem, uh, profit for creditors. So there's a redistribution, but not a problem for the overall economy. 
Or would you think that it's a problem for you if you receive money with a higher purchasing power? No. If you receive as a creditor higher with the money with a higher purchasing power, you can, or you can consume more than before, or you can make more investments than before. Okay, but then it goes on, and then the enemies of uh, deflation, which among us, the enemies of deflation are the friends of inflation, they make another argument. They say, okay, but price, price deflation can be so extreme that the debtor goes bankrupt. So he cannot even pay back his loan. So then the creditor is also worse off because he does not receive money with a higher purchasing power. Some of his money he does not receive at all because the debtor goes bust. Eh? And this would be bad because companies go bankrupt even though they have a viable business model. Uh, if they would be fully equity financed, they, they could have uh, survived. So what is the response to that? Again, the society would not be worse off. The production potential of the society would not be hampered. Imagine a factory owner that is in highly indebted and there's a price deflation and therefore he cannot service his debts anymore. The consequence of his bankruptcy is a, is a change in ownership. The old owner loses control of, or of his assets, of the factory, and he loses the control to the creditors that better predicted the evolution, evolution of prices. So the bankruptcy just implies a redistribution and a change of ownership. But the factory, the machines, the workers, they will not disappear by the bankruptcy. They are still there. They can still produce. And the creditors, if the business model is viable, and not just a bubble, bubble factory, bubble business model, but it is viable, then they will continue production. Uh, they will continue pro production. The production potential of the economy is not hampered. The creditors may actually even hire the former owner as a manager uh, if they are interested in his knowledge of uh, running the business. Because sometimes the argument goes, yeah, but then the entrepreneur goes bankrupt and he has all, the, he has all his uh, private, uh, subjective, inside knowledge on how the factory has to be run. Yeah, but, but you can. The creditors could hire him. And then the question is, of course, is he really such a good entrepreneur if he anticipated the evolution of prices uh, so badly that he in, over-indebted himself? Um, the creditors, if they have no expertise in running the factories, they could also so sell the factory to competitors in the field that have ex expertise in this field. Or they could, could have just renegotiated uh, the loan if they believed so much in the capacities of, of the entrepreneur who was formerly the owner. And we also have to recall that bankruptcies are not bad. We cannot, we, cannot, we, we cannot say that some amount of bankruptcies is too much or too little for a market economy. We cannot say that. Bankruptcies have an important function. That is, they shift the control of resources and factors of production to those most capable of employing them for cons consumer needs. And this happens also when prices fall and debts cannot be serviced. Okay, so these were the main myths and errors about deflation. Where comes the aversion against price deflation come from? Well, mainly from those debtors that would lose if prices would fall. All debtors are always against price deflation because it could lead to the bankruptcy. No? So the finance industry opposes it. Highly indebted big businesses, and most importantly, um, the biggest debtor in our economy. Do you know who that is? Our best friend, the government. Yeah, the government. Yeah. All these players have a very strong interest to portray deflation as a catastrophe. And unsurprisingly, they are also 
the first ones to receive the prescribed, prescribed medicine against deflation, the new money. They are the first ones. They are in a privileged, privileged position to receive the new money first that is injected to prevent price deflation. And we should never, never forget that this new, new money not only causes redistribution, but also causes new malinvestments, new bubbles, new distortions. Okay. So you already are here, we have them again. Um, so you can understand that I titled my, my, my book in defense of deflation because price deflation per se, only falling prices are not bad for the economy. We have all, always we have to look at the causes of price deflation. If a price deflation occurs in a free market because there's economic growth or uh, there's cash building, even if it's a free market reaction to a government intervention into the banking system, in the case of a bank credit deflation, uh, we cannot say that it's, it's bad. Hmm? Of a different nature is of, course, is, of course, price deflation caused by the government, fiat deflation. Hmm? So falling prices per se do not pose a problem to the economy as a whole. They just lead to a redistribution and they endanger the position of over-indebted companies, and the political el elites. Huh? And they have, these elites, of course, have an interest and portray deflation as an ogre. Uh, and this explains deflation's bad press. Um, in fact, deflation can have the liberatory effects of uh, bringing down the bankrupt mo uh, banking system, monetary system, and bring down, the, bring down uh, over indebted political elite. So, long live deflation. Thank you very much. <laughs>